Great. So let's dive into this. Today, I want to enable all of you to think much, much more clearly about impact so that with the limited time and resources we have, we are focusing on the things that really matter and that are going to work. And I want to give you some tools that are going to enable you to achieve way more impact than you could ever imagine in what is a very limited amount of time. Like you, I'm a full time academic. I don't want to work evenings or weekends, which means that I have to, in reality, achieve impact in the cracks between everything else. And that is a real challenge. No matter how much you might want to do impact, finding the time is uh, an issue. And it is for that reason that uh, I called the company Fast Track Impact. And today we are thinking about exactly how we can fast track your impact. We're going to be running for two hours. It's going to be highly, highly interactive. Um, uh, I'm, I'll kind of see how we're feeling if I think we need to take a specific break around about halfway uh, or if uh, there's been enough kind of uh, activities that we're able to pace ourselves. Um, but just take a break whenever you need. Otherwise, uh, you will have seen that uh, you are all getting access to my books. Today's course handbook is the Research Impact Handbook. And you have access to the PDF version of that in the chat now. Uh, but also in the chat is uh, a PDF copy and an audiobook version of my subsequent two books, uh, The Productive Research and Impact Culture. And of course, you can get hard copies from my website, but enjoy. Now, we're starting with a digital icebreaker, and it's a bit of fun, but there is a serious message behind this, which is the take home message from today's session, which I hope is going to be memorable because of the way that we're going to explore this. So in a moment, I'm going to invite you to turn your camera on if you are able to, to angle your camera, make sure that you are uh, on gallery view, not speaker view, so we can all see each other. And I'm going to ask you to show us what you are wearing on your feet. Once you've done that, I want you to head over to the chat and tell us whose feet, socks, slippers, shoes, you want to swap places with. You don't have to remember the name of the person, just describe the footwear. And we'll see if anyone's wearing any uh, particularly popular footwear. Uh, as I said, yeah, it's an icebreaker, but we'll uh, come to the serious message in this uh, in a moment. So uh, I have uh, not thought ahead here, clearly. I've got some very boring uh, grey socks um, and instantly outcompeted by Rosie with uh, some very nice uh, rainbow stripes. Uh, Lizelle is wearing some like some nice work shoes I like. Um, As is Chloe, wonderful. Fern is looking very sporty, ready to maybe go for a run afterwards. Alison, Crocs, uh, shoes for every occasion, I love it. Uh, Liz is competing on the stripy stock socks stake. Um, Razan uh, also ready for the gym. And uh, yeah, Louise, I can just see the sole, but uh, you're not going to go uh, slipping anywhere. <laughs> Kate. Is that slippers? I'm not quite sure. Uh, and uh, Katrina, thank you for joining all the way from Australia and making us feel jealous over here uh, in bare feet. Uh, Sebastian, your socks looking very warm as well. I'm not sure whose footwear you saw, but um, uh, I think I'm going to go with... Um, uh, hmm. I'm going to go with, uh, yeah, Lizelle is, it, it, we're still seeing, uh, yeah, I'm just going to, just for, for sheer <laughs> persistence, I'm going with Lizelle. I have a, a wonderful pair of work shoes I bought before the pandemic hit, and I've worn them once. <laughs> so I would love to be wearing some, some nice work shoes. So um, I'm going to go with work shoes. There we go. <laughs> Um, the lace-up boots. Um, it was at uh, Alice's lace-up boots. I'm not sure if I saw them. Uh, excellent. Uh, Alison's Crocs are getting some love. Um, yeah, we have a couple of barefooted people. You know what? I am quite jealous of just it being warm enough to be barefoot. Um, so yeah, Lisa is on that vibe as well. Yeah, and I think you look. Yeah. It's going to be the barefoot are winning. So uh, Australian colleagues, uh, well done. Without any footwear at all, I reckon you have uh, you have uh, won this contest. So uh, over to the serious message now. We have just metaphorically exemplified a concept 
And this concept, the literature suggests again and again, is what works if you want to achieve impact. Uh, if I do impact this way, following this kind of approach, this principle, then what I do is more likely than not going to work. What is this principle that explains what works when we want to achieve impact? Uh, and the clue, of course, is that we just exemplified this metaphorically in this exercise. What could it be? So one word answers, if you can, in the chat. Over to you. Any guesses? Katrina kicking us off, engagement. Great, we are engaging with each other. There is two-way information. I'm not just saying, look at me um, from the front and, uh, and you're all just watching. We're all saying, hey, look at me, and we're exchanging information with each other. Uh, Fern and Dawn also saying sharing. It's that two-way thing. And of course, there are many, many right answers to this question. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, uh, sharing two-way knowledge exchange, absolutely uh, a, a crucial part of what works. Um, uh, George, it's about something that resonates. Uh, of course, we all have uh, shoes. We all need to wear something. In fact, we all get the idea of, yes, I remember the long and distant past when it was summer and wearing uh, nothing on my feet. Um, uh, so loads of ideas. Thank you. Uh, relatability in a similar. Uh, yeah, we've all got feet. Uh, we all need to wear something. Uh, I am just like you. Uh, I'm not somehow above you or other or different. Uh, and so we are able to to create um, that 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 connection uh, that perhaps goes beyond connection and interaction. As Collins, Collins called it, to collaboration. Uh, very good. Um, thinking different, uh, everyone counts, absolutely. But the most recent answer, uh, Mariana, is exactly what I was work looking for, the word empathy. And uh, Tim said earlier, walking in somebody else's shoes. And of course, there is this metaphorical definition of the word empathy, which is putting yourself into somebody else's shoes, imagining what it might be like to be them. And this is what I'm going to suggest is our starting point. I think a lot of us think that the starting point, if I want to make a difference, is I need that big idea. Uh, and uh, great, a, a good big idea might be part of this, but it's not the starting point. Uh, the second place people go is, well, clearly, uh, then I need an impact plan. And yes, you might need an impact plan, and we'll look at that later. But again, it's not the starting point. For me, the starting point is asking who are those people out there who might even vaguely be interested in the kind of stuff that I'm doing? Why might they be interested? Who are they? Uh, let's uh, stop building our ivory towers and throwing out our big ideas from the top and missing the mark, taking a scattergun approach, wasting our time, inadvertently squashing a few people up as we go. Uh, let's take a different approach and go and find these people, open uh, these channels of communication that create connection, and now see us and our research and the world through their eyes. And now I can see that felt need. I can see the evidence uh, that is all around me now for the challenges these people are facing, the opportunities that are out there that we might be able to build on. And now I can focus on that one thing, or maybe a couple of things with what limited time I've got that will genuinely resonate, that will meet a real felt need. And what little time I have is going to be invested well. And so part of the reason this saves you time is it's so much more strategic. So many of us have great ideas and waste so much time on the scattergun approach on ideas that actually, if we just opened that channel of communication earlier, we would have realized it was never going to work. <laughs> it was always going to have negative unintended consequences. And so we stop wasting our time on that scattergun approach with all of the negative unintended consequences we have to clear up. And we focus on the things that are actually more likely to work. But because we've opened those channels of communication, we discovered that there are all these people out there who want to see the same change as us. And now impact becomes a team sport. It's not just me. There are people, organizations, groups who have funding, time. They're going to put people into this. And this is no longer just me and my limited budget 
and time. Uh, I'm now using evidence to power others' work out there, and we're collaborating and achieving way more than we could achieve ourselves. And all of that comes from this very different empathic starting place. Now, we're going to get very practical. We're going to look at two tools towards the end, and one of these is a tool you're going to try out. Uh, that is designed to help you to take that step of empathy systematically and then take an evidence-based approach. Because as I said, the evidence comes back to this again and again. What works is this empathic or relational approach. We're going to take an evidence-based approach to doing this in a way that will work and will save you time. So that's coming. But before we get very practical, I want to build an ethical foundation and then a theoretical foundation so that we think clearly and we're not actually wasting our time trying to achieve something that turns out isn't impact. So let's start ethically. And I would like to ask you a question. So it's a bit of a left field question, but bear with me because what I'm trying to get at here are your intrinsic motivations, which may or may not have anything to do with impact. But I think that to understand where impact fits for us personally, we need to start with a much deeper and broader understanding of what we bring to our work. What gets you up on a Monday morning like today and makes you feel inspired? What are the things that give you that sense of overwhelming satisfaction at the end of a week? thinking, wow, I love what I do. I can't believe I get paid to do this. What are those moments that give you those flashes of inspiration? And for many of us, it will be all of the above. But what are the things that are most likely, most commonly, most frequently going to give you this sense of inspiration? You can vote at any point. And I'm going to suggest some common answers. And if it's not on this list, then write your answer in the chat. But for many of us, uh, and in my experience across the academy, the most common answer I get is curiosity. Whether this is learning stuff that is new every day uh, or uh, yeah, stuff that's, yeah, that's kind of in the, out there uh, in, uh, in the domain of our expertise, of, of, of our discipline, or the brand new stuff, that privilege we have of discovering things that were never known, new insights. Perhaps it's the creativity of the process. I still haven't found out that thing that I've been trying to pursue my entire career, but you know what? I am still endlessly fascinated because of the creativity of this whole thing. Uh, maybe it's knowing that my work made a difference. Maybe impact is intrinsically motivational to some of us. That is the thing that, that motivates, that drives us. Or maybe it's just a challenge or something else. Over to you. The majority of us have voted, so I'm gonna give us maybe three seconds to finish up and we'll close that there so there is a little bit of a self-selection bias I suspect given that we've all come to a workshop to learn about training today and so you can see 35 percent of us uh, we are uh, primarily motivated by making a difference and for those of us who assumed that clearly, obviously, everyone else is motivated by the same thing as me, huh, insight time, <laughs> maybe not, uh, we are, happen to be in a minority. Um, and uh, adding up the two curiosity ones, hmm, that's kind of similar. And there are all these wonderful, glorious, rich, different motives that we bring to our work. Uh, so uh, did you write in a chat? Let's just have a wee look at people who are motivated by other things. Um, yeah, influencing younger scientists. Uh, it's maybe that just one PhD student who goes on to do something incredible. Uh, and that's that's my legacy. That's good enough. I, I've, I've done my job. <laughs> uh, very often, these are things that don't fit into the categories of what our funders are looking for, what our governments and research assessment exercises might be looking for. But you know what? That's what motivates me. And my plea to you is well let me actually let, let me let me let me ask you another question yeah before we go deeper into this because uh, before this is uh, too um long in your memory i want you to hold your answer to this question in one hand so this is my intrinsic motivation this is what i love this is what inspires me uh, and now i want you in the other hand to hold your answer to this question 
this thing that we refer to as the impact agenda. Impact as defined by our funders, our institutions and our governments. How do we feel about this? And in particular, I want you to take that feeling, and it is often a feeling, and compare and contrast this to your intrinsic motivations. And ask these intrinsic motives and extrinsic incentives for impact collide, how does that make you feel? Do you feel generally comfortable or actually quite uncomfortable? And so for many of us, especially those who said that, yeah, actually, I am intrinsically motivated by impact. Well, great. This is an inherently comfortable place. Uh, I love this. And I'm now being paid to do stuff that gets me to put the stuff I love at the top of my to-do list and spend time on impact. I can outcompete all of my colleagues because impact is what I do and it's what I do best. And actually, on some deep level, I've always kind of felt that as an applied researcher or someone like me who gets involved with policy and business and get my hands dirty, that people kind of somehow have looked down on me that, yeah, I'm not really pure enough as a scientist, um, deep enough as a theoretician. Um, yeah, somehow uh, I have to apologize for that. And actually, no longer. I feel deeply legitimized because of this whole impact agenda. Uh, yeah a great place to be. Is that you? And I'll open the poll in a moment. But before I do so, I want you to think, because even those of us who are intrinsically motivated by impact often quite feel quite queasy when we think about how this is framed by our funders, institutions and governments. Well, yeah, I'm up for impact, but not if it's actually about return on investment and growing an economy that I think is destroying the planet, when in fact my research is all about dismantling the, the companies that are destroying this, threatening, uh, disrupting the status quo, d dismantling capitalism perhaps even. Um, yeah, how does that fit? Um, yeah, I want to achieve impact, but I want to spend my time doing impact, doing good, not having to evaluate it and write that up and jump through all these hoops that I'm told I have to jump through now. I, I want to do impact, but yeah, it's that one PhD student, and I don't really care about the reach, but these other people do, and so I still don't feel comfortable about this. And for those of us who are less applied in particular, uh, this can be a deeply uncomfortable place where we feel that we're not allowed to be who we are. I am intrinsically a curiosity-driven researcher, a challenge-driven, a creativity-driven researcher. And this is part of my identity. It's part of who I am. And yet I feel like I have to apologize for this. I'm just a, cur a curiosity-driven researcher um, uh, when the world seems to have moved on. And that is an uncomfortable place to be. I'm going to swear, but I'm quoting someone uh, that uh, was uh, interviewed uh, by Jen Chubb from uh, University of York. Uh, we co-authored a paper in which we quoted this, this researcher who said, I'm doing shit research now because that's what they wanted. In a sense, I can't even ask the questions that are most academically significant and original anymore because they're not fundable if they're not impactful enough. So how do you feel about this impact agenda? especially when you bring this together with your intrinsic motives. So this connection, this uh, sense of how your intrinsic motives interact with these extrinsic incentives for impact, is that a comfortable place to be or not? And once you've answered, and I can see a load of you have already, I would like you to go to the chat and tell me why. And I'd like to invite some of you to go on mic. So raise a hand if you'd like to speak to your answer or otherwise write your answer in the chat. It's a large training today, so I won't be able to read everyone's, but I will try my best to read through as many as possible. So please do that now. And uh, let's go straight over to uh, Sebastian while you're finishing voting and uh, and writing your answer to the question on the screen. Sebastian, over to you. Thanks. Um, actually, I would agree with, with both things, um, both comfortable and uncomfortable, but uh, in the perspective, um, let's change the system so that those points that are making us uncomfortable with the impact agenda are actually from the table and so that it's more really accommodating all that we need for. No? Great. So what can we do where we see that discomfort? 
to change things. Um, and there's been a lot of stuff that's been written about things that have gone wrong, especially in countries like the UK, where we have very strongly incentivized, including money to institutions, if we get this right. Uh, and the arising of conflicts of interest as a result. Well, I get impact, I can get research funding, I can get funding for my institution, which maybe comes to my research group. In some institutions, I can get promotion on the basis of this stuff, basis of this stuff. We need to think deeply uh, and carefully about this stuff, and we need to challenge our institutions and the wider systems where this is going wrong. Uh, and so if you read my book, Impact Culture, that's the reason I wrote this. I, I watched as this all seemed to be going wrong in the UK, leading, leading up to our last research excellence framework, uh, and asked the question, uh, what is the damage that is being done to our culture? And how can we take back some control over our own impact cultures and create the kind of nurturing, uh, compassionate cultures that draw people to impact on their own terms? and that to empower us to achieve whatever it is that we think might make a difference, whether or not it fits into the boxes. And so uh, throughout uh, to th this morning's training, I want you to think and hold on to uh, your intrinsic motives and ask yourself, how can I achieve impacts in ways that will be intrinsically motivational to me, whether or not uh, I, uh, 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 it, whether or not it fits into the box of my funders or institutions or whatever it may be. Uh, what is that thing that I would love to do? And just, yeah, working in my own children's school. That's all I want to do. Uh, let's just start there. Uh, my cousin, for example, uh, she studies 19th century feminist English literature. What's the impact of that, you could ask? Well, for her, it's uh, been about working with um, uh, reading groups, uh, setting up reading groups for women who are um, uh, victims of domestic abuse and opening these texts to them from this feminist perspective to enable healing and empowerment. And she, out of principle, is not telling her university about this. This is uh, about doing something that she feels is meaningful to her and that she wants to do. And I want to empower you to do that because these are the kind of cultures where we just do this because we want to on our own terms. Uh, and that's the kind of environment in which impact flourishes. Uh, and in which, yeah, uh, a few years go by, someone comes along and wants to know, was there an impact? Uh, and yes, some of that stuff just happens to tick some boxes or fit into the right boxes. Great. Uh, but we didn't do it for the box, uh, uh, for the institution, for the funder, whoever it was. We did it because uh, we wanted to for our own reasons, uh, based on our values. Uh, in the chat, you can see a link to my Unsung Impacts Prize, where we uh, just ask people to to share things that you are doing that are making a difference that inspire you, but that you would never tell your institution. We've got examples from around the world, and I defy you to not be inspired as you read them. So let's end the poll and have a look at some of the chat. And we have uh, yeah, 60, 40, uh, most of us generally comfortable, uh, and some of us quite uncomfortable. And so, Sebastian, uh, I'm working from the bottom up here. Uh, well, isn't this an ethical obligation? Uh, and I'm going to suggest for you, yes. So do it for those normative reasons. Uh, but uh, many of us went into academia for very different reasons. And I would argue that, uh, that yes, perhaps we can't justify the majority of public funding going into curiosity-driven research, but I would argue that we are poorer as a society when we no longer value knowledge for knowledge's sake. And actually, if all we need is short-term solutions to problems, then there is an army of consultants who can do that job probably a lot quicker and more inexpensively to the taxpayer than we can. We have a unique value proposition as researchers in terms of the depth to which we go uh, and the focus on originality uh, and breaking new ground and finding new solutions to old problems, uh, building on that knowledge for knowledge sake type curiosity driven research. So I would argue, yes, Sebastian, absolutely. And I feel that obligation too, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we all feel driven by that. Um, uh, uh, so uh, there, are, there are perspectives and I wonder if anyone else wants to, uh, to, to pile in there. Um, 
uh, Jume, apologies if I uh, pronounce your name wrong. Um, funders want to know if their money is well spent and that can be used as an indication, uh, yeah, uh, and think for public funding. Uh, we need to know that at least a proportion of this has made a difference. And again, we can't demand that it all has a difference because so much of this is beyond our control. Yeah? Politics, for example, <laughs> uh, and I don't know, look, education research as a, a nice example of a highly politicized uh, policy area in every country I've ever visited, uh, how much education policy is actually evidence-based versus politically driven. It doesn't really matter. How, um, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so we can't demand that it is all impact driven uh, but we can expect that a proportion is uh, and so yes we have these processes that uh, evaluate impact uh, and tell us if our research is making a difference and uh, Kerry wants that to know that and I think we should all be asking Kerry's question is my work actually making a difference uh, especially if that's something that intrinsically motivates us uh, but I would argue whether or not it in intrinsically motivates us, we do have a moral, moral obligation to check at least that we are doing no harm. <laughs> uh, uh, and of course, if we are, then we need to do something about that. Uh, Alison, over to you. Thanks. So I, I've got two points I think I'd like to make. My, my research is very applied and, and it mm. ought to be impactful. Um, but there, I think there are two, two aspects that we, we struggle with, or I struggle with. Um, I think industry has far too much say. So industry decides where the money is going to go because they're on all of the um, the peer review of proposals that the UKRI have, and they decide what they think is good and what they think is not good. And so that that's the first the first point. Um, and then there's a there's an aspect of credibility, um, which might also come back to the same thing that uh, certain scientists in big universities doing exactly the, the way industry think it should be done versus me having a novel idea that is not the way that it's been currently being done being pushed to one side because nobody believes it's possible mm -hmm. and i think those two two sorts of things happen even in the most impactful and most applied areas mm -hmm. um, and, and if it's if it's like that for me then it must be a hundred times worse for those who are doing more knowledge driven um it, it research so that, that's my issue so thank you yeah um so i think that that, that is real um i think that um you know, the way that the engagement and impact assessment in australia was set up with um uh, external industry funding as, a, as an indicator um uh, you've mentioned ukiri uh, especially directed mode uh, whether it's industry or policy i hear as many uh, gripes uh, about uh, policy involvement uh, we have this thing known as the haldine principle uh, i thought that uh, research and policy was meant to be independent and yet we have a set of priorities that seems to be set uh, by those with power whether that be industry or, or policy um uh, and I'm not here to defend that. Uh, I think that there, there are some real problems here, some real challenges here. Uh, and uh, the whole impact agenda then helps further funnel us into things where, well, yeah, it's set up, it's easy. We can get those uh, easily verifiable economic metrics. So we're making a difference uh, and, uh, and we're keeping everyone happy. Uh, and I think uh, people say this is a conspiracy theory. Uh, if that's the case, then I guess I'm a conspiracy theorist. Uh, but when you look at the roots of the impact agenda uh, in every country where it is flourishing, uh, it has its roots in policy debates. And those policy debates are very explicitly neoliberal policy debates that are ultimately about return on investment and demonstrating that uh, that we can invest in research and get a uh, a, a return on that investment. Um, uh, in terms of UK PLC or whatever it may be, uh, whichever country we're in. Um, and of course, instantly we realise it's not that simple. Uh, what about the things which are good for the environment, uh, good for people that uh, actually are about degrowth, for example? Uh, and uh, if you're not familiar with that word, um, then just Google degrowth um, or read uh, Less is More by Jason Hickel. Um, yeah, there are so many different approaches here, and I think that we need to challenge, and we need to challenge all of those status quo. Uh, hence, uh, my book, Impact Culture, my training, Impact Culture. Let's not just be complacent here. I don't know. We're going deep here, and um, we've just got a couple minutes left uh, on this before I move to the next discussion exercise. But uh, but this is what I want to do. I want to open up this ethical space. 
where are we doing this thinking? Yeah, actually, uh, there may be good reason to feel uncomfortable about this. Uh, whether or not I was thinking about this before, and what can I do about this? How can I at least uh, avoid or, or be transparent about what might be a perceived conflict of interest? So whether or not I feel that there's a conflict of interest, or I believe there is one, it may still be implied and, and perceived, and, and I need to do something about that. Um, Great. Um, that is a couple of things on the chat. Let's go through some of these now, I think, uh, and then we'll we'll leave on. Tim saying the trouble with novel ideas is it isn't necessarily a good idea. It needs to compete against other novel ideas. Um, uh, so the novelty has uh, no value per se. Uh, impact uh, shouldn't be defined solely in financial terms. Um, and I think that every nation that has gone down that line, it has its roots in, yeah, let's demonstrate return on investment and be able to protect a research budget or expand a research budget. Fantastic. And then we start getting into the gut of it and we realize, oh, it's a bit more complicated than that. And so what we have in terms of uh, each of the national impact evaluation frameworks um, yeah, that I've seen and, and studied, and, and I'll put a link to a paper in a moment with, uh, with more on, uh, on those internationally, uh, they are more sophisticated than just return on investment. Uh, they don't give government exactly what they need in terms of making those arguments back to Treasury. Um, uh, and uh, let's balance this argument to say that as a result of these, I think we are seeing more investment in impact than ever before. And whilst we need to be aware of those conflicts of interest and the negative unintended consequences arising from that investment, I think we are also seeing new impacts that would never have happened uh, had we not invested in the way that we have. Now, we're moving from this ethical foundation now to a theoretical foundation, and this is crucial. I'm going to give you a, a one word thinking tool that many people tell me is the most powerful thing they learned from this training. It transforms your thinking. And before I give you this word, I, I want to emphasize how important this is and the repercussions of getting this wrong, because so many of us think we know what impact is, but the reality is it's a little bit woolly. And the big area where there's wooliness is the difference between engagement and impact, which is why I think the Australian system is so great in the way it very clearly separates the two. And there is a difference and it's an important difference. And so uh, if I'm unclear about this, I'm going to have problems and I'm going to be focusing on generating potentially a whole load of hot air and noise, which makes no difference whatsoever. And thinking that I've had impact. Um, two particular areas where you're going to have problems uh, is funding and then research evaluation. So uh, I've sat on a, on a panel a couple of times now for one of the UK funders, uh, and it's an impact fellowship scheme, which is why I've been asked to go on it. It's all about impact. Um, uh, and uh, the last time I did this, we looked and there was uh, about 50% of the applications to these impact fellowships did not have a single impact objective. Now, clearly, they all thought they'd written impact objectives. Uh, they'd probably gone through rounds of pre-review, and everyone who'd looked at them, including many of the peer reviewers, had not noticed the problem. As a panel, we spotted no impact objectives, therefore you are instantly unfundable. That's a problem. What they had instead were engagement objectives. And the same applies to, uh, to, to research evaluation. Uh, a year out from the REF 2021 process in the UK, uh, I was receiving uh, impact case studies to review from across the sector. Again, uh, before they're paying someone external, these had gone through rounds of pre-review and about 50% a year out had not got any impact in them. Uh, they thought they were, it were impact case studies. In fact, they were engagement case studies. So a lot of very clever people are falling into this trap. And in fact, uh, this is work uh, led by my PhD student, Bella Reichard, um, uh, and others. Uh, I'm putting this in the chat uh, that shows that the number one predictor of low scores in REF 2014 was people who fell directly into that trap. They wrote about their engagement instead of their impact. Oops. So I'm trying to, I'm saying this to try and kind of knock you out of that complacency. Well, come on, Mark, get on with it. I know what impact is. I need the tools. Hold on a minute. Actually, do you really? And so 
uh, what we have uh, is all these people who come to me saying I, I've got uh, I've done all this public engagement I've got all these social media metrics uh, in fact I'm famous I'm on tv on a regular basis fantastic but uh, what I hear is loads of engagement which is important fantastic I'm really pleased that you're doing all of that engagement but at minimum I need to know that at least one of those people who engaged with what you put out onto the tv actually learned something really important that they didn't understand before that's a fairly weak form of impact. I want to know that they ideally did something with that. It was uh, more useful in some other way as well, but at least someone understood something new. For all I know, you've spoken so much jargon that nobody understood a word. Or in fact, maybe you actually offended millions of people. I don't know. The reach, I'm going to suggest, is meaningless unless you know there is something significantly impactful. Uh, and the other common example I get is policy engagement. Well, we wrote a policy brief, we did webinars, we did seminars, we did one-to-ones with these high-level people, and we got invited to give evidence to the parliament. That's truly impact. Maybe even I got quoted in some kind of parliamentary report. Uh, no, what you've got is fantastic engagement. Again, I need to know at minimum that somebody who listened to what you said understood. Uh, and ideally, that understanding now is transforming policies which are going to do social or environmental or some other good. Uh, but for all I know, actually, yeah, maybe the wrong people turned up. The, the right people turned up, misunderstood what I was doing, and now there's some new policy that's an abuse against human rights in my name. I don't know until I've checked. And so the word that I'm going to suggest, take out the word impact, from your head, do a find and replace and put back in the word benefit. And for most people, the mists suddenly clear. Ah, so that is where my engagement becomes impact. As soon as all of that engagement, I can see there's a benefit for someone. That's the point at which I've got an impact. If I can't see any benefit yet, then uh, I need to do an evaluation. I need to ask some people, is this working or not? Uh, uh, or I need to continue doing more engagement because my job is not yet done. It's not had any kind of benefit yet. And as soon as I ask that question, who benefits, I realize that this is more subjective than I would ideally like. And there are very often as many winners as there are losers. Uh, what might be a good thing for me could be a bad thing for you. What could be uh, good in one context, in one time, uh, could be very different, could be harmful, damaging, even to the same group in a changed context or a different time. And so in your research impact handbook, you see I've used this word good, making the point that this is a value judgment. And if there's any doubt in anyone's mind, let's remember this is the good we do out there beyond the academy in the world. We're not talking about citations and good for our academic colleagues or our discipline here. And in uh, the paper, which I've just put into the chat, uh, we've used this word perception next to uh, what we can demonstrate because, yeah, demonstrate to whom, <laughs> for what purpose. Uh, we're ignoring all of those value judgments. Uh, perception matters, impact is very often in the eye of the beholder. Uh, for those of you who joined late, apologies for the issue with the passcode. And here is your link to the Research Impact Handbook, as promised, and my other books in the chat as well. So, I'm going to see if you understand this because this is foundational and if we don't have this theoretical understanding of actually what impact is and where engagement stops and impact starts then we could just be spending a whole load of time money energy generating hot air or potentially even negative unintended consequences so at this point you're probably still thinking yeah mark this is easy i get it <laughs> but see if you can answer this question so uh, I'm going to uh, open the poll. You can answer at any point. And I'll start from the bottom up and uh, and I'll move um, through all of these. But one of them, I'm going to suggest if you accept my definition, is by definition not an impact, at least not yet. Is it a cultural impact? The most challenging one I ever had uh, to evaluate uh, was cultural benefits from nature uh, with a specific emphasis on spiritual benefits. We got a divinity professor, a philosopher, an economist, uh, and we got some answers. Uh, it took an entire research project, but uh, but yeah, uh, cultural benefits. Is that real? Is that uh, a benefit or not? 
uh, health and well-being impacts. I made people healthier. I protected them from ill health or harm. A technological impact. I've got a new technology, an idea. It could change the world. Perhaps I've patented that idea. A social impact. Um, this could be social policy, some other social goods. Perhaps I'm closing the attainment gap between boys and girls in a particular subject at school or transforming the curriculum. An environmental benefit. I have enhanced the environment. I protected it. Or perhaps I've made money or saved money. One of these, if you accept my definition of impact as a good or a benefit, I'm going to suggest is not an impact, at least not yet, which is a bit of a clue. <laughs> Over to you. Let's see if you can get this. Okay, not an easy question. We're just over halfway. I'm going to give you a little bit longer to see if you can get this. Okay, and I think we will close that there and see what we've got. So you can see it's stop sharing here. Um, let's go from the bottom up. Um, those of you who answered economic, and I suspect actually those answering um, uh, most of the other answers I wasn't looking for, I suspect you're doing something a little bit too clever because you realized that there are trade-offs. Uh, and uh, we can all think of a lot of examples of things that made lots of money at the expense of the environment or people's health or whatever it may have been. Uh, and of course, you're right. Um, and we should be suspicious and careful and look for those trade-offs. But that doesn't mean to say that we couldn't uh, create some kind of idea that might save money for um, our National Health Service, for example, uh, that is un 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 unambiguously a good thing without trade-offs. So uh, an economic impact is possible. But yeah, uh, in each of these cases, we need to think about the, uh, the trade-offs. Uh, cultural is, is challenging. How do you measure this stuff? Uh, in the paper in the chat, you'll see a whole load of advice on how to evaluate impact. And uh, I've got, a, I think, a session, a free session coming up on uh, evidencing impact, uh, which I'll go into much more depth on. But um, uh, you'll see, uh, especially methods from the arts, humanities and social sciences, uh, this is going to be quite in depth. You might need some time and some funding to do this, but it is possible you can evaluate this stuff. Uh, one of the other issues people say is, well, yeah, great, I, I've got some kind of spiritual benefit from nature, but uh, ultimately uh, that's all about um, how that translates into uh, my health and well-being. Um, and yes, I can see that there may well be uh, a health, health and well-being co-benefit or subsequent benefit. Uh, and in each of these cases, you can see one benefit leading to the other. We saved some money, uh, but it was uh, because we saved energy and that actually reduced greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, huh, we've got... Uh, an environmental co-benefit. Um, uh, so, so yes, uh, some of these may be earlier stage, uh, later stage, they may link to each other. This is not that simple, but I am going to suggest there is such a thing as a cultural impact, and we can discuss that in more depth if you wish. And so uh, give yourself a pat on the back. Uh, more than half of you, I am impressed, uh, got the answer technological. If you are a technologist and you would like to argue with me, then I'm very open to arguments. Um, everything is contestable, including this, <laughs> and I'm not always right. Um, but uh, the point I'm going to suggest is that a technology is only a stepping stone or a mechanism through which we generate impact in the same way that we use public engagement or policy engagement. It's in that same category. Uh, uh, and so, so great, I've got a technology. It might save the world. For all I know, um, I've patented it. Fantastic. Uh, but until I've actually got this into people's hands and it's working at scale and it's saving money, making money, protecting the environment or whatever it is, at that point, it's generating benefit and it fits into one of those other categories. Uh, but um, but until that point, well, it's just an idea that may or may not work. Uh, and in fact, uh, I'm very glad that there are many things that have patents that have never been made and they should never be made. And of course, we can all also think of technologies that were invented for good cause, but have been used to kill, maim and destroy. So let's uh, think about technologies and that's an important 
mechanism for impact, let's do that. Absolutely. Let's do our public engagement, our policy engagement, our technology development. But let's keep our eyes on the prize, which is to make sure this actually delivers benefit. And if it's not, we do something to course correct uh, and make sure that we stay on course to impact. Now, I said I'd give you a moment to uh, to argue against me, to put a different perspective. Um, and uh, Alison is saying definition of economy isn't right. Um, so maybe you can expand. I think you'll have to come on mic to do that, if that's OK, please. So, um, um, yeah. Yes, I mean, that's, that's the, one of the crunches that I've been banging my head against. Um, while we think of economy as just money, then it's not the whole circuit. And I think the the way that we think about economy as just money is the problem. Um, so if you think of economy as the general good for everybody, mm. so the economy of the environment, the economy of oxygen content, the economy of CO2 in the atmosphere, the economy of health for people, that way of thinking about economy would fit would yeah. fit your definition but the economy of, of money for money's sake isn't Th that was the reason i i put that box yeah uh, yeah i knew you were being more sophisticated than my question could uh, could make out uh, all of you who got the wrong answer uh, but actually got the right answer for your own reasons because that is a very sophisticated answer and i could not agree more <laughs> uh, absolutely Alison. Um, thank you uh, so 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 yeah let's let's think about what we mean uh, by 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 good um, and and let's not allow ourselves to be duped by uh, the idea of of economic growth for growth's sake uh, as a, as an intrinsic good. We always have to think uh, much more holistically, and the more holistically we think about the economy and its interconnectedness with everything else, the more likely we are to avoid negative unintended consequences. Uh, but equally. Uh, take an, e an economic lens uh, to things that can't be counted uh, can also be perverse and, and uh, from everything I've learned about trying to understand the cultural benefits from nature uh, I think there are some things that uh, we simply can't or shouldn't ever attempt to monetize uh, using uh, economics methods I know, I know that wasn't what you were suggesting Alison but no 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 to cover but, that one but, this is actually yeah. a debate I've been having you you talked to about having unsung impacts, but it's one of my unsung impact activities um, mm. has been discussing about this issue and about is there a benefit to technology? And uh, so, yeah, we've gone around some of this, but we're coming to different definitions, as you say. Uh, there are some very strongly saying that if we hadn't had any science, then we would be much better off. But actually, that cannot be true. But it is the enabler for making the good that it is. And so is, where, how do you separate that, the enabler versus the knowledge? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Hannah on the chat, uh, building, I think, uh, on that, perhaps tangentially, apologies if that is, but um, I think uh, there is value in research that doesn't have impact directly, but provides stepping stones of impact in perhaps 20 or 50 years. Uh, that's not even conceived of impact at the time and, and i agree we need to value knowledge for knowledge sake yes we may find it hard to justify putting the majority of our funding there but we need to protect that um, uh, and pursue those curiosity driven projects and ideas those uh, new theoretical insights new methods things that won't uh, instantly yield impact um, but if you are a non-applied researcher i'm going to suggest that you use the tool we're going to look at uh, in the next uh, segment uh, instead of uh, using that tool to identify uh, groups, individuals, uh, organizations who might be able to directly use or benefit from your work, use this tool instead to identify more applied researchers and research groups who might be able to use your pure science, your theory, uh, these insights that are not applied uh, in a more applied setting. Uh, and now you get to open your mind to be even more curious because you're working with all these amazing academics from different disciplines, different approaches, and you're loving what you're doing and being who you are fundamentally. But you're also now slowly building an arm that could one day be more applied. But it's not you that does that. You play to your strengths and be authentic whilst empowering other more applied researchers to follow lines of research, which might uh, one day in 20 to 50 years, uh, as you suggested, uh, get to that place. I want to validate you uh, being yourself, not having to fit into some box that you don't fit in. Um, 
Uh, Louise is saying it's hard to tell colleagues that what they're doing is simply engagement with no evidence of impact. Uh, advice on this um, is simply to say, great, now let's go and have a look. Um, and it could just be a, a very simple um, uh, online survey. It could be using uh, the postcard to your future self method. I'll stick this in the chat. We'll look at this and many other um, techniques in the uh, evidencing impact session in a few months time. Uh, start getting that data. It will be intrinsically motivational to you to see this is making a difference. You'll be able to start following this up longitudinally, compliant with any legal uh, obligations you have about storing data, etc. Uh, and not only is that motivational for you, uh, but now you have the evidence is working or not, as the case may be. Um, uh, so, uh, great. Uh, so we're coming up to halfway and we have um, over 100 people so this may or may not work um, so uh, we're going to give it a try anyway uh, I, usually at this point i use a google jamboard because uh, we have been thinking at this point uh, about how we might um, identify impacts and we've been thinking about some quite instrumental and often long-term impacts and there's a problem here because the evidence is quite clear uh, these more impressive impacts that our funders institutions governments uh, most want to see often take decades there's a number of publications now uh, based on uh, UK data and Hong Kong data now uh, that suggest we're looking in decades uh, potentially for those most impressive impacts. And that's a problem if you're an early career researcher. That's a problem if uh, you're trying to do something to answer an urgent need. You're doing more co-productive research, perhaps, where you're asking people to work with you and help you and they expect something back. Well, maybe in a decade or two by which time I might be retired, I might be dead, uh, I'm probably not gonna be in this job. Uh, yeah, next year we're already too late, actually. <laughs> and the result is this whole thing can feel quite extractive. So uh, let's start thinking about some early stage impacts uh, in which we can give back. And in particular, I'm asking you to think of things that you can do that are gonna be impact that you can do now. And this is gonna be evidence-based all the way. However, you can achieve these impacts before you have even collected your data or published it. Uh, and this is not about going uh, beyond the data. This is uh, about us saying, well, we build on the shoulders of giants all the time. I know the evidence. If you're a PhD student and you've done your literature review and you understand everything you wrote about, that's good enough for you to now start doing public engagement, policy engagement, working with a company around this stuff, as long as you don't go beyond that evidence. Uh, and we should all be doing more in the way of evidence synthesis, I would argue. And that means now already I can start giving back. I can write that policy brief. I can uh, do a training course, whatever it might be. Uh, and I'm still collecting the data. Eventually, I'll get that published. And by the time I have published this now, I've built the networks, the confidence, uh, the, the social capital that I can hit the ground running with uh, the stuff that I can now attribute back to my research. So evidence-based all the way, but we can all start now with these early stage impacts. Now, the problem with these is that they are all arguable. And uh, I'll explain much more about this when we do our evidencing impact session. Uh, ultimately, we have to create an evidence-based argument that this was in some way beneficial. Uh, but I'm going to suggest that there are many things we can do which are still impacts. Uh, we can make that argument, and we can marshal evidence to do so, but they're early stage. In each case, you should probably be able to think of how that might ultimately lead to, say, an environmental impact. Great. But the early stage is something else. So, for example, uh, I'm thinking about uh, that episode of Blue Planet with David Attenborough, uh, all about uh, marine pl plastic pollution. Uh, and there is now a growing consciousness globally that we've got a problem with marine plastic pollution. And I would argue uh, that uh, whether or not we have yet solved the problem of marine plastic pollution, that's the environmental impact that is coming eventually, that may be years or decades away, the fact that we now have raised public awareness globally around this issue, that's important. And I can make that argument and say that's a benefit. Uh, so arguable, early stage, 
weaker uh, than ultimately where this ultimately ends up going. I'm going to want to trace that and see how that matures, but I can still argue this is a benefit. Uh, and oops, that was my next slide. Uh, here is your link to the Jamboard, and I'm going to show you what this looks like and give you a, a small lesson. On the left hand side, important is a vertical toolbar. You can see I'm just hovering over this here. It says sticky note. That's what I need you to press if you want to add a uh, an idea. And I'm inviting types or examples. So the type I've just given you there is understanding or awareness. And the example would be um, Now, if you write uh, the mechanism, getting your TV into Blue Planet, I'm going to be happy with that, but it's not impact. How many people have got their, their work integrated into TV programs, appeared on the news, and there's no evidence that, nobody, that anybody was listening, let alone that there was any benefit from this. I'm going to put it in brackets, and I'm going to ask you to tell me huh, what actually was the uh ah, okay there's a limit you can't all get on <laughs> um so for those of you who are on i would like to invite you to use the jam board uh for those of you who are not i'd like to invite you to add this in the chat we're going to group similar ideas together uh there's probably going to be too many ideas to fit so be aware that you can uh size these resize them if you've got a different idea than somewhere else and instantly uh, i'm going to move this to com conversation thank you putting it in brackets uh, Altmetric will give you loads of this evidence. The fact that the whole world is talking about my research means nothing if they hate it um, and they all want to kill me <laughs> because uh, ultimately this is causing so much uh, devastation uh, internationally and it was all my fault. I need to know that there's some benefit coming from that uh, conversation. And so I'm going to suggest uh, at minimum uh, public awareness of an important issue arising from that uh, Twitter conversation. Yeah, uh, but maybe there's something else you had in mind, in which case, please edit this. Um, so we've got a change in the conversation. Maybe there's something going deeper here. Maybe this is attitudinal change. So yeah, we change um, uh, knowledge, um, uh, awareness, but this is a, a heart and minds conversation now. We're going deeper than this. Um, so great, uh, there we go. Someone else had exactly the same idea. Um, so we are informed, uh, but how much uh, information actually goes in and we understand? Um, so I'll take that as, yeah, we are informed. We understand something, good. Um, so we have a change in knowledge. Uh, and awareness leads to a change in attitudes, perhaps or perhaps not, which then leads to a behavior change. Uh, with lots of very large assumptions. Oops, um, that uh, was the wrong button to press. Please do keep your ideas coming in the chat as well so that you can all integrate into this, please. That would be great. Um, and so at the bottom, we've got knowledge, awareness, moving to attitudes, moving to behaviors. Um, so yeah, getting people's interest, fantastic. Uh, change in public attitudes, brilliant. Okay, change in behavior, that could be a change in practice. That could be uh, clinical practice, uh, it could be business practice, uh, teaching practice. Uh, and, and yeah, we're doing things more efficiently. We expect that to lead to uh, a saving in money. We expect that to feed through to patient well-being and health outcomes. It's not happened yet, but we can already see the change in practice. And yes, it's weaker uh, than the ultimate change we expect to see in terms of the, the saving um, or uh, the patient benefit. But it's still, I can argue, that it's um, a benefit. Uh, creation of a tool or technology, I'm going to say uh, no uh, in brackets. If you can... Uh, Oops, um, something weird happened there. <laughs> um, let's uh, let's go with, um, uh, yeah, tell me what is the benefit from that? Now, there are so many tools, technologies that were money wasted. In fact, debt created that was never paid back. Um, this is not necessarily a good in and of itself. Uh, what is the, the good that comes from it, please? Stakeholder engagement, not necessarily, but this is, yeah, it's meeting needs. What are those needs? Give me some examples, please. Um, 
so a sustainable technology um let's uh, let's emphasize that word sustainable what do you mean um can you tell me a bit more uh, we've been invited to provide input uh, but how many times have we been invited to give evidence that nobody listens to uh, what if they misunderstand uh, one of my friends got interviewed on the, 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 the Drive Time Radio 4 Today programme, um, uh, and his questioner said, what do you just said? I didn't understand. Can you say it again? And he said it again and again, and he used different jargon every time. They got to the end of the interview, and the, the interviewer uh, just had publicly humiliated him as being unable to speak in plain English. Uh, great. Fantastic opportunity. Any impact? No. Uh, what impact he had was negative. Sadly, I, I just I was cringing all the way through it. The poor guy. Um, uh, so so yeah, maybe, but maybe not. Um, so I'm looking for um, uh, yeah. So let's go with this one. Um, uh, something I'm looking for is capacity building. So um, uh, so so I'm going to suggest this is um, just stop screen sharing now. It could be training. Uh, this could be, uh, the, yeah, I've got some data, but uh, I've turned this into a database with a decision support system or just some kind of simple decision tree. So now people are enabled to do things with my data that they couldn't do before. It's not just open access. Um, so uh, going beyond understanding and awareness to, yeah, I have skills. I, there's things I can do now that I was unable to do before. Uh, I, I'm connected to people who can help me in ways I didn't have those connections or uh, access to skills or funding or whatever it was. So there's so many things we can do in this space as well. But I wanted, what I wanted to do is to look across the Google Jamboard. Uh, for those of you who can't access, I'll just put this back on screen. Uh, but ask yourself now and form an intention. Is there something that I've spoken about that you've seen written on this board that you're thinking, yeah, there's a draw, a sense of intrinsic motivation. That's something I could do. That's something that doesn't feel too scary. That's something that feels rewarding, that, that I would want to do based on my values and my interests. It would make me more curious. Hey, talking to people like that, understanding their problems, they're not going to respect disciplinary boundaries. Perhaps now this is what makes me fall back in love with what I do again, because it makes me so curious. Uh, maybe actually I'm going to have to engage with the creative arts and uh, and think more creatively about how to overcome challenges. Uh, and actually it's that creativity that's going to be the spark that drives me because I'm engaging with impact. Ask yourself, what were your intrinsic motives from that first poll? And are there any things you can see here that are impact that actually you feel intrinsically drawn to? And that's where I'm going to suggest you start on your terms as we move in to our final segment where we look at tools and we try one of these tools out. So I'm going to share a few concluding slides and then we're going to have um, a uh, a question and answer session. So I can see a couple in the chat already. Keep them coming. Um, and uh, and yes, um, I will. Um, if someone could have a look actually for me, I'm going to just give you the uh, uh, the link to where this should be. Um, and do tell me if I have a poor memory. But all of my free discussion sessions are here. Um, and I'm just looking. I thought there was a session on uh, on evidencing impact, and if there isn't, then um, yeah, I clearly need to do that, don't I? Hmm. Um, I, there is on my YouTube channel for now. <laughs> uh, great question. Apologies for that. Uh, I have a hopeless memory. Anyway, here is my typology. You'll see this in the book, but the key point I want you to, to, to make here is that you can use this as a checklist. So uh, I think a lot of us get stuck on the things on the right hand side, um, and that can be quite disempowering. I, I'm looking at what other people have done, and that just feels unachievable. Me, my research team, project, PhD, budget, I, I just, yeah, it feels beyond my reach. And so uh, ask yourself, are there co-benefits from those things? Can we get more value out of that uh, as we're writing our research proposals and such like? But also ask myself, are there things I can do early stage? 
Uh, and now as I'm writing my proposals, I've got a whole load of things which are all impacts and I can create the framing and argue that these are beneficial, great. And I can put them in causal order so I can see one thing leads to the next, leads to the next. And those ultimate things, yes, may be decades away and beyond the lifetime of my project. But my reviewers now don't say, yeah, right. Anyone can say that. They say, yes, and I can see exactly how this project might make that possible. And I'm going to give you the brownie points for those big, ambitious ideas as well. And so be aware that there are causal links. A change in understanding or capacity might transform attitudes, which might transform uh, behaviours, which might inform uh, transform decisions, which may be policies. But uh, policy wasn't on that list of longer term impacts, uh, not because it doesn't take time, but because I would argue policy should always be seen as a stepping stone as well. All of these early stage things, yes, I can argue that these are beneficial, uh, but I'm always going to want to ask the question, well, yeah, but what happens next? And policy is no different. Great, we've got a new policy. It's evidence-based. This should work. But what is the evidence that it actually works? And in our analysis of high versus low scoring REF 2014 case studies, it is interesting to note that uh, the high scoring case studies in the policy segment we're more likely to talk about both policy change and how those policies have been implemented to deliver public good. Uh, whereas the low scoring policy impacts, uh, we're more likely to only talk about the policy with no evidence that those policies were actually working. So we need to stay the course. Um, even if we're no longer directly involved, we need to see how this um, stuff ev uh, evolves over time. So lots more in my book. Um, I want to cover off a couple of points I think I have covered already. So yeah, the non-applied people, uh, this is for you as well. We're going to use a tool known as stakeholder analysis. Um, and uh, I'll explain how you can use this. Uh, well, I'm just going to tell you now, use this to identify applied researchers and research groups rather than those uh, external uh, non-academic partners, organizations who might directly benefit. Uh, one debunking slide, and then I'll conclude, um, which is this idea that everything we do that is impact has to be attributable back to us and our research. Yes, your funder will want that, your institution, any research evaluation will ask you to attribute this back to your research. Uh, and that's fine. However, that does not mean that we wait until we have all, all the evidence we need. As I've said, great, carry on with that journey, collect the data, publish it, go through the peer review process, be sure that you are sure of your evidence before you put it into any domain where it may be used to derive benefit. However, there is already rigorous evidence out there and we have a task to do to know that and where possible to interrogate that critically to do the evidence synthesis work and now to be able to start now and we can all start now there is no excuse as long as you are sure of your sources and build those networks those connections those skills that confidence and secondly, we will see these uh, terms. I've been using them. Hopefully they're fairly obvious, but if not, you can see some definitions uh, on the screen. And people will tell you that they are of equal importance, but I'm here to tell you that significance matters more. Uh, I don't care how big your reach is. You can have global reach, but if it doesn't really work, or if actually it's kind of 50-50 winners and losers, then I've got a, a, an international success story and an international disaster on my hand. And I'm not quite sure how happy I am about that, actually. <laughs> it, what we need to do is we need to start small and check, is there a benefit? Does this really work? And now you know this works for one person, one team, one group in one context, and it really works, it's genuinely beneficial then start thinking about reach. Uh, and at that point, reach often is self-evident. You've got people knocking on your door saying, hey, I can see how that worked. Can we get some too? Uh, but make sure that you have done that evaluation. You understand how this works. But to conclude, as I said, and then we'll break for some questions. Um, uh, for me, this is about one thing and let's keep our eye focused on this goal. I'm going to introduce um, and we'll try out um, one of two tools that we're going to look at in this final segment. But uh, but I think it's very easy to still use these tools in a very tick boxy kind of way. And I want us to go into this final very pragmatic session uh, with the heart of the impact agenda uh, in mind. 
I'm going to do this with a metaphor and a word. I went to London South Bank with a colleague and uh, we drew a sign that read smile and we grinned at random passers-by. And to our surprise, the majority of Londoners gave us a big grin back. And we did this to illustrate a metaphor, which is that good ideas spread like an infectious smile. They spread through the warmth of human connection. And it is this empathic approach, which is what works. So as you read your book, you'll see five chapters that map onto these five principles with loads of practical ideas. And they all, however, come back to this core concept of empathy putting yourself in the shoes of those who might one day benefit from your work or be able to use your work to benefit others. This is my daughter wearing my shoes in my front garden. So a lot of us say, well, yeah, Mark, but you're either born with this or not. It comes easy to some people, uh, not to me. And that's a fair point. I think it is easier for some of us, but I would still argue this is a skill and you can learn this and you can get better at it. And that's what the first of the two tools we will look at after we've broken for some questions will do. We have been going for a while. I'm going to uh, break for, let's have a look at my timings here. I'm going to break for about 10 minutes of discussion. So if you'd like to take five of that or 10 of that for a wee comfort break before we come back to the tools, uh, these tools are things that uh, are used all over the world now. Um, they're all open access, not even a copyright. You can use them, adapt them, call them your own. They work. That's why they're so widely used. And crucially, they get you impact and they save you time. So come back at half past where we'll move into that final segment. But for now, we've got uh, an extended time for questions. So uh, raise your hand if you'd like to ask in that way. Otherwise, in the chat, and Kate is kicking us off with a question about attribution, particularly in the area of attitudinal change or policy. How can we prove causation rather than correlation? Um, and uh, given that I've uh, falsely advertised a session that is not coming up, um, uh, but which is on my YouTube channel, I'm going to give you my slides for my um, evaluation session so here we are um and um but so it's actual change i'm going to suggest um yes you're right they're difficult challenging um, and uh, and talk to some social scientists about the methods that can be used for doing this uh, the sad news you'll see in uh, our paper about evaluating impact um, which i gave you linked uh, previously is that for some types of impact, uh, you will require um, research uh, and rigorous research, funded research probably at that to be able to prove any claim and uh, changes in attitudes uh, falls into that category. Uh, and um, and you're probably going to want to use uh, social science methods for doing that. Uh, you'll also see a rich seam of methods from the arts and humanities that are uniquely able to, uh, to, to evaluate and make explicit things that otherwise would remain implicit and impossible to evaluate. Uh, but uh, I'm going to share one slide, since uh, there's been a bit of a theme of questions around evaluation, uh, on the policy impacts. Uh, and how you um, evaluate them. And so um, here's a, a, a real life example, which comes from my own impact case study, which uh, ended up scoring four star in REF 2014, sorry, REF 2021. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna share oops, the link to that if you want to read uh, the full case study where this evidence is featured um, but first of all you can see on the screen here uh, it looks like there's an announcement it could be some kind of a bit of policy a strategy a bit of legislation it's uh, but it may cite your work happy days um, and uh, have a look at altmetric.com if you want to see if your research has been cited in a policy documents for free uh, nice wee tip there um, but the problem is most of us don't have that. Now, we think this is us, it was our work, but there's no citation. How on earth do I prove that? So the first thing is I need something that looks credible. This could be me. Uh, we put this kind of stuff into the policy uh, domain and it's come out in, a, in an announcement. Uh, was this us? Mm -hmm. It's worth looking into this now. The second place I go is my pathway. 
So can I see evidence that uh, these ideas were in the policy domain and that we had put them in, or at least that they were linked back to our research in terms of those pathways? Uh, so, yeah, we were asked to give evidence. It got cited in some reports. Um, uh, here's our policy brief, etc. In this case, it was a report by uh, the UK's Committee on Climate Change. Uh, and so I looked at the report and still no citation. All I got is an acknowledgement that I advised the committee highlighted uh, in the screenshot. But I thought a bit more and I was like, hmm, I know that I advised the consultants that built the model that came up with the numbers that they put into their recommendations. So let's go and talk to the modelers. Can you show me your model, please? It was a spreadsheet model. They sent the model and here we are. This is where we strike gold. And in gold highlight are two papers from our project that are powering this model. So uh, that is indeed, as I suspected, where those numbers came from. Um, and so now we have what is still, I'm going to argue, circumstantial evidence. All over that pathway, uh, clearly our evidence is in here. Uh, surely, what are the chances that, uh, that our evidence didn't lead to that? Well, it's fairly convincing, but it's not convincing enough to be watertight. And so I will use a testimonial interview um, and it's not just writing to someone, uh, have a look at my slides for more on, uh, on my approach to collecting testimonials. I'm interviewing someone, really probing, understanding what's going on here. Uh, and now, in this case, I'm saying, so that uh, thing in the in the budget, um, uh, uh, was that you that um, I, I tracked down eventually? Was that you that made that recommendation? Yes. Um, uh, where did that come from? Uh, it was a recommendation from the Committee of Climate Change. Huh, I thought so. Uh, are you aware that that recommendation was powered by this model uh, that was powered by these papers and showing them the evidence? Uh, no, I wasn't. But yeah, I can clearly see that that is the case. So on that basis, are you willing to say that this was based, uh, this recommendation to Treasury was based on uh, this report, which in turn was based on all of this stuff? Yes, uh, I'm happy to draw that full causal chain. Uh, and now we've got from research to impact, uh, we have uh, our evidence. So not easy. Um, uh, that's not a, re a full research project. I don't have to design a randomized controlled trial. You may have to, depending on what you're trying to claim. Uh, but this is tractable with a few methods. So, uh, Amy, what tips do you have to embed impact into everyday practice? I really enjoyed the discussion around the difference between engagement. Thanks. So, uh, so for me, everyday practice, this is about this empathic mode. And so we're going to do this first tool uh, known as a stakeholder analysis. I will uh, problematize that word stakeholder, but uh, we're going to try this tool out. And as soon as you've done this, now I'm seeing the world in, in, in a new way. I'm seeing who these people are that I need to connect with. And now I'm beginning to live life, to do research in connection with these people. I'm in their networks, they're in mine. I'm seeing my work, I'm seeing the world through their eyes. I see opportunities I would never otherwise have seen. I uh, join and contribute to teams out there doing things I would never otherwise have been able to contribute to. Uh, impacts begin to abound. Um, uh, so, so for me, that is the key thing. I do that initial work and now I invest what limited time I have to start with in building those relationships. So time for one more question before we dive into that. Um, Alison, what's the value of review papers or just plain scholarship outputs in the face of chat GPT? Um, so uh, for me, um, uh, this is about the evidence upon which uh, we, we build and just uh, have a look um, at my Twitter stream. So it's at Prof Mark Reed. You'll see I've quote tweeted um, Eric Jensen, who uh, used um, uh, uh, chat to GBT to, uh, uh, to, to ask, I think the question was, um, uh, to, to write an essay or tell me uh, about um, science policy, evidence-based science policy dialogue. How do you do science into policy in an evidence-based way? And it came up with this incredibly sophisticated set of arguments, which are all based on evidence. Um, but uh, you'll see, uh, he's, he's like, can you spot what's wrong with this? Um, and you'll see my answers. Um, I'm not sure if any others have, have answered this. There was this massive bias to, well, maybe it's because you were used the word science in the question, to one way of understanding what is knowledge 
and what constitutes valid knowledge, that there is such a thing as evidence-based policy, uh, that there is one right answer, and that we need to be the purveyors of uh, those excellent and right answers. Uh, compared to an evidence-based policy approach, which suggests there are, could be many different lines of uh, academic argument, all with their own rationalities and evidence bases, against lines of moral argument that might suggest we do the opposite of the evidence because that's the right thing to do, uh, and so on and so forth. It goes far, far deeper than just that. You know, have a look at the Twitter thread to, to get a sense of that. And of course, chat to GD, GPT uh, will replicate whatever bias there is in whatever evidence there might be, whatever literature there might be out there, which is exactly what it did in answer to Eric's question. Um, and so uh, so we uh, have that power of critical thought. Uh, your average person, uh, maybe even a policymaker, for all I know, a slightly scary thought, uh, puts a question into chat PC, GPT, write me a new bit of legislation. Maybe that works. I have no idea. I've never tried it. <laughs> um, God forbid. Uh, and yeah, uh, and it is credible. Look at what it came up with. Uh, and at first glance, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, hold on a minute. And I would argue that is surely at least one of our jobs. <laughs> Great. So it's coming up to half past and I want to move to our final segment now where we're going to look at some tools. We're going to try one of these tools out and we're going to uh, do some breakout rooms. Uh, assuming that works with the number of people we've got, we shall see. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's let's dive into this. And I just want to come back to something I said right at the very beginning. Because one of the most common questions I get is, Mark, I want to achieve an impact. I've got limited time. What would you suggest as the first thing I should do? Um, and I want to just debunk, as I said before, these two starting places, which I think are the wrong place, but that many people start with. The first is with that big idea. If I can just have a big enough idea that could change the world. And until I've got a big idea, until I know that works, then impact is something which is, yeah, for the future. Uh, and it's not to say that having a good idea is not really important, depending on what you're doing, you may need the, that big idea. Um, but that's for me, not the starting point. And the second starting point, um, uh, which is just as credible, but for me still not the right starting point is, well, I need an impact plan. Uh, seems relevant, but if this is you from your ivory tower, even you and your research team coming up with this, how do I know that I haven't just replicated a whole load of biases and assumptions that I have from within my every tower that might actually just take me down a path that's a waste of time that would never have worked had I not just checked with someone outside the academy to see what they thought. And so, yeah, we'll come to that. And my second tool is all about impact planning and having a good idea is important. Let's absolutely not devalue that. But my starting point is to ask yourself who out there might even vaguely be interested in the kind of things I'm interested in. And how could I create some kind of connection with people like that and understand where they, where they are coming from? And so, oh, that's the wrong presentation. Um, here we are. On to my practical tools. Um, uh, Louise, asked, Louise, actually, before we do that, can we impact plan in hindsight? Um, probably not, but I would say it's never, ever too late. I've completed the research um, uh, and we are in dissemination mode. Do we carry on just dissemination mode with our press office? Um, uh, and uh, nothing wrong with that, but uh, have a look at my book length media impact guide which I co-wrote with the uh, conversation and uh, and let's just change gears here and say let's try and do this thing we were calling dissemination uh, in knowledge exchange mode uh, let's try and even begin to co-produce some of this stuff and let's focus on what could be the significant benefit that we could get from this uh, and that may mean now based on the tool you're about to use targeting what we're going to do uh, i haven't done any proactive media engagement for years but i'm doing it now because there's a bit of my research that i want to get to the farming community i'm targeting farmers weekly in the uk because that's the audience i want the numbers might be small as a result compared to if i were to aim for the guardian but i don't really care about guardian readers given that it's farmers who can use this thing <laughs> so target and focus on the benefit uh, and uh, and see where you go with that. Um, 
And uh, Tim asking, uh, what about the unexpected impacts? Um, and yes, let's keep an open mind to this. We'll think about impact planning. Uh, but for me, uh, I'll show you the, the tools I use to monitor as I go. We also need to have an open mind to the opportunistic things and, and capture them as we go, uh, have a way of monitoring that uh, as we go, which is not going to take too much time. Uh, and for me, the way that I do that is that I am in constant communication with people. Uh, and so, um, I, I don't know, uh, this morning before I started this, um, the Scottish Government asked me to record a 10 minute presentation uh, about um, the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the scalability and the timescales within which um, uh, ecosystem markets could uh, contribute towards climate change mitigation in, in Scotland. Um, uh, and, um, and that's because I'm in their network and they know that I've got some of the answers. At the end, I was like, and here's a bunch of things that might also contribute. I don't know anything about them, but I'm sure you know who to go and talk to. Um, and so you get those opportunities opportunistically because you're in people's networks. You know them, they know you, there's that trust um, and this stuff just happens. So keep the questions coming. We'll make some more time at the end, um, but practical tools. And we are starting with this tool that's known as a, a stakeholder analysis. I'm now calling this a three eyes analysis. Uh, a paper that I'll be submitting shortly uh, is my latest contribution, but you can read others in your handbook or in the peer reviewed literature or on my blog, where you will also find two blogs and two podcast episodes about why we might problematize this. And please do join my newsletter uh, on my website again if you want to find out how you might join me in an open authorship uh, attempt to write an article and a Wikipedia entry on alternatives to the word stakeholder. But essentially, we're asking three questions. Who is interested in our research, even if vaguely, or not even, as the case may be, I'll come back to that. Who of these people who might be interested might have some level of influence, either to facilitate my impact or to block it? And then finally, who is going to be directly impacted by this, either positively or negatively? And why? Let's explore, let's think critically about this. And what comes out of this? Instantly are two groups, but many more things. And I want you to try and see what insights come out for you in a moment. So first of all, you have the high interest, high influence, high impact. Clearly, we need to knock on their doors. They may not be knocking on ours. These are the people for whom my impact is their impact. Their impact is my impact. I can be in their team. They can be in my team. They're going to throw staff time, resources at this. All of a sudden, I can suddenly scale my ambition beyond anything I could have imagined. Impact becomes a whole lot easier and quicker and more effective. But equally, we find those groups who are not actually interested in what we are doing. By definition, they have no influence. They are the poor, the oppressed and the marginalized. And yet they may be more impacted, either positively or negatively than anyone else. And we have a moral obligation to reach out to them and try and engage them in what we're doing to understand how we can make this as beneficial as possible for people like that. And so I'm going to give you five minutes of an individual working task on this. And then I'm going to invite you to go into small groups. We'll keep them fairly small to swap notes and see how you got on. I am enabling screen sharing. So uh, when you get to your small groups, you can share what you did if you want. Uh, if nothing else, I'm hoping that you will be able to work through one person's and discuss that in a bit of critical depth before we come back. But to make that possible, ideally, the majority of you will have done something. If you're struggling for any reason, feel free to take a five minute uh, comfort break. Yeah, but hopefully in the next five minutes, uh, we will all have completed one row. So uh, name of an organization, choose something you're vaguely familiar with. If you're non-applied, maybe it's a research group that you know are more applied, who do work that uses your kind of non-applied research. Um, maybe it's a professional body. I'm a geographer. Let's go with the Royal Geographical Society. Maybe it's schools, but let's think about uh, which part of the curriculum, for example, uh, or someone else. Uh, their level of interest, high, medium or low, but why? Which part of their organisation? Which part of the research? Their level of influence and or impact. Write about one or the other or both as you can and tell me why. And if there's a gap, hmm, don't know. So let's go and do a wee Google search and see what we can find. So over to you, an individual task. And to do this, you need a handout, which is about to go into the chat. 
and do feel free, feel free to use these, share these, adapt these, make them your own. They're not even copyright. And uh, to make this work, you need to download it first. And once you've downloaded it and open it in Word, it will become editable. And you'll see the second template we're going to conclude with there as well. But uh, also worked examples in this. So over to you, five minutes for a individual quiet exercise. See how you get on. Oops, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I guess we're about halfway through. So that's one minute left. If you can try and get all the way to the final column. Okay, your time is up. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to stay in the main room. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to put you into groups of two or three. And I would like you to swap notes. You're going to have, uh, let's go with eight minutes for this. So you've got a two minute warning, 
if you look at the top of your screen and then a one minute countdown and my hope is that that is enough time for one of you to go in some depth and share what you've done you can share screen that is enabled or just talk to us uh, or if uh, none of you have had any success to uh, discuss why what's going on uh, what can you learn from that uh, so um uh, over to you and then we'll have a look at our final tool before we conclude uh, your rooms are now open or opening, I should say. <laughs> or not, as the case may be. So let's go with um, slightly larger rooms, see if we can get that to work. Ah, there we go. Over to you. Enjoy. So please do join your breakout rooms if you've not done so already and discuss what you've learned. If you're staying here because you have a question, then uh, please feel very free. A few people who haven't joined yet. It'd be great if you could do so. Okay, uh, a few people staying in the main room for some reason. It would be really handy if you are moving um, to adjoining, please to do so. Otherwise, I'm just going to rearrange these so that everyone has got someone with them. That's the theory. I think, yep. Looks like everyone has a partner now. Ah, sorry about that, Rebecca. Uh, do you want to discuss with me then, Rebecca, anyone else who can't join your room? How did you get on with that? Um, what did you learn? Any insights, problems, questions? You can answer in the chat if you feel more comfortable doing so. <laughs> and no worries, Fran. Uh, brilliant. Yeah, that's also fine, Martina. Yeah. Lots of very good reasons for staying in the main room. <laughs> good. No, oh, sorry about that, Derek. Um, okay. Uh, Derek, you, you, you speak to me instead then. Um, uh, how did you get on? So that's okay. uh, sorry, it was only me, myself, and I. 
Oh, sorry about that. Quite a few people didn't join the rooms, um, so I tried to get everyone rearranged and uh, obviously didn't entirely succeed. So yeah, how did you get on with the tool, Derek? How, how was it for you? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I've got something on, but uh, I'm not sure whether it's the correct mm -hmm. thing that I wrote. Uh, basically, um, I was the one who wrote about the eateries using digital nudging um, for uh, food waste reduction so mm. it, yeah my, my team and I we, we did a, a big project uh, involving restaurants back in Malaysia mm -hmm. we, we chose one particular restaurant and we, we said oh let's use digital nudging uh, to see if we can put gentle reminders uh, while people are eating because the best ways to change people's behavior is when they are actually performing the behavior uh, and we got them to do some altruistic benefits uh, through uh, digital posting and also some reminders uh, when they post up on uh, finishing their food on their plate. Mm. So I think in terms of the influence, uh, it could be high because restaurants are always thinking about, oh, let's try and save money because we found that once uh, customers actually finish their plate, somehow or rather operational wise they save on money and then you know ultimately it's food waste reduction and that's just a summary <laughs> great so just instantly i can see in terms of the the way this is working for you um that you're seeing uh, there are benefits uh, economic benefits for the the eateries um, mm -hmm. and that's something that is going to get uh, the people on side uh, the question then is which of those eateries is most likely to be um, uh, to, to is most under pressure? Uh, it has the the, the the tightest margins, for example. Might you then go for those first um, in terms of uh, your early adopters? Are there any other reasons why you think a particular category of uh, of eatery might um, might go for your work first? So can you then kind of subdivide uh, based on that insight around the, the economic benefit for this? Uh, but then in terms of customers, is there a particular type of customer who is uh, intrinsically more likely uh, to be receptive to this based on your research? Uh, and what could you do to tailor some of these uh, early kind of pilot work with those targeted restaurants um, to those kinds of customers, for example? Mm, that's that's a good question. Um, the case sample that we did was basically um, it, it's a casual dining. Uh, restaurant and I think the people that usually go to casual dining restaurants are people who are social media uh, people so <laughs> I, I think that the two worked very well you know because uh, I, I think this was also so uh, yeah we're yeah. going to be joined by people in in the, in the next few seconds if you can just finish up but carry on what, what were the, your final insights go for it yeah, so I, I guess uh, uh, post-pandemic, a lot of people were thinking about um, sustainability impact and something that they want to do for the world. And uh, this kind of um, altruistic behavior, uh, especially if people are going to talk about it. Um, yeah, the, 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 I, I don't know what I don't know what to, what to make of it, but uh, yeah, it, I think this is just a starting point that. Uh, I'm trying to see where it goes in terms of direction, but yeah, happy to talk more. <laughs> Thank you, Derek. So welcome back, everyone. I think that is us all back in the main room now. Uh, I wonder how you got on with that. Uh, any insights uh, into the chat? I'd love to know what you thought of this. Um, and I'm just going to put up my screen for you. I'm going to conclude in a moment with our final tool, but uh, as you just heard, Derek and I were discussing some work he's been doing around uh, food waste in restaurants um, and just using the tool to realize, okay, actually the restaurants are interested because it's reducing waste, which could actually um, uh, make their margins better. Uh, so which are the, the restaurants now that are most under pressure from their margins? Who do we target first uh, in terms of that insight? And then those who are eating, uh, actually it's a digital tool Tool that they're using, uh, perhaps this is a particular generation of uh, of customer that we might be targeting, um, uh, or who might have a, a certain set of attitudes uh, that might make them more predisposed towards um, uh, wanting to do this. 
so instantly you can see how you can go from well yeah restaurants to, uh, and people who eat out to something much more targeted uh, and that helps you then to work out oh this is how i might actually now adapt what we're doing to be appropriate to those specific groups and their needs and get them on board and get them motivated and inspired to come with me the so um any thoughts reflections questions in the chat i'm going to um come back to to them I can't say any just now uh, and uh, just conclude with this second tool because now is the time that we can start to think legitimately about an impact plan uh, so let me just stop sharing for a moment um, let's just think about how this saves you time quickly so uh, I've um, uh, I've reached uh, so I've done my stakeholder analysis my three eyes analysis uh, and now I'm choosing two maybe three people organizations I'm going to reach out to and that's not just a broadcast email here's me here's my research talk to me it's here's you here are your strategic objectives here are the challenges I can see you're facing here's how we might be able to help can we talk that gets you a yes and those two or three conversations are enough now for you to be able to take an even deeper step of empathy into their shoes to understand now what they might be facing and what impact might actually look from their perspective. Now, at minimum, just with those insights, I can write an impact plan that's going to be so much more powerful and effective. But ideally, I potentially get some involvement from them, uh, from other researchers who have regular engagement with the kind of people that I want to benefit from this. And this can be not just an individual task, but a team task. If you just scroll down your tool that you've just been using, you will see my impact planning templates uh, much more on my website, in your handbook and in the peer-reviewed literature. You'll see a worked example of this as well. Uh, but the first three of these colleague, uh, columns is going to come out of that first tool that you've done. Uh, and now I'm targeting, all right, so if these are the people, and that's their interests, uh, that's their influence, uh, this is what could go wrong, whatever, that, this is how I'm going to engage with them. And I've got tailored activities, different things for uh, MP, uh, members of parliament versus civil servants uh, versus agency staff on the front line uh, that is going to really meet them where they are. Uh, so this is an empathic approach to impact. I've got indicators of whether the engagement's working and the impact, and I separated them out so I don't get confused. I know how I'm going to measure this, whether qualitatively or quantitative, so this is realistic, and I can keep track of this and see how this is going. I'm identifying the risks and how I'm going to mitigate them up front rather than allowing my reviewers to do that, spotting the problems, resolving them. And again, doing this in collaboration with these people who might benefit is so much more powerful to see what could go wrong that I would just be wasting my time on, or worse. Who's going to do what and when? What resources do we need? We turn this into something that looks like a plan. And this now is this relational approach. This is now tailored. And now uh, I've got a whole load of goals. I'm going to focus on one, maybe two. Uh, I discuss with people. I manage expectations. Well, no, for this project, with this timeline, with this budget, we can't do all of these things. But here is something we could apply for together. Talk to my colleague. Now I've got one or two things which I know will meet real felt need. I've got people working with me on these. And you can see my worked example here is not just me now responsible for everything actually some of these things are going to be led by uh, the organizations that ultimately will uh, help derive that benefit uh, and uh, this now becomes a team sport so very quick very easy each of these tools will take you half an hour to an hour to do yourself um, uh, at least an hour if you're doing it with a research team um, or with a few people from outside coming in to help you. And there's a, a worked example of a facilitation plan in the back of your book that can help you to do that. But I'm going to conclude with next steps and then I'll hang around for any questions, because uh, for me, it's really important that you do something based on what you've learned today. So I want to invite you to write an intention in the chat now. You can do this privately or publicly. If you provide your email address for this purpose and this purpose only, I will contact you one month from today I'll quote you back to yourself and I'll ask you so did it work how did you get on and if it didn't work and you want help I will invite you to contact me reach out and I will do what I can to help you or just say yeah let's meet a colleague I went on this course uh, here's the recording of it which I'm going to put onto YouTube 
and uh, and let's meet up after a month and spot notes and support each other. But I plead with my, my plea to you is do something, write that intention now and be accountable on it uh, to me or to someone else. And that's how you can be accountable to me. Uh, and this is the el electronic version of my postcard to your future self uh, technique. Uh, it's important that you can get in touch uh, however uh, you decide to be accountable. So if you want help from me at any point, you can get a guaranteed response within a week if you email my, email my PA Mari, not me. So please do let me know how you get on and I'll give you all of this information in an email via Eventbrite afterwards. Um, we're not doing a feedback form today because this is a free training, but I am going to give you a link to my free follow on training, five steps over five weeks that will enable you to take this deeper wherever you are in the research cycle. And I would love to see you at my forthcoming events. So we have more trainings, we've got a reading group, discussion groups um, and much more. So that's us one minute to 12 uh, UK time. I'm going to conclude things uh, and just put those links into the chat for you uh, and encourage you to stay as long as it takes to, um, uh, to write your intention and decide if you want to be accountable to me or not on those intentions. Uh, so uh, yeah, there's all the links for following up and I look forward to continuing working with you all.